day. Come on, y'all. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Right where you are. Just give him praise for this day that he has made, a day that none of us have seen before. And so we are grateful and thankful that we get to see it because a lot of people did not. And that is something that we should really take into account every single time that we take a breath or open and close our eyes. It is not guaranteed that we will see another day. So praise you, Lord, for allowing us to do that and for allowing us to come together in fellowship and to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. And with that, we say greetings. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our Tuesday night online church services where we give all glory to God for what he is doing through this is Global Church Body Alliance as we normally do. We like to begin by extending hellos and welcomes and salutations. To our beautiful, beloved, majestic sister church in Garland, Texas, Oasis on the Mount, Church in the Healing Center, led by my brother, Pastor Chris Pipkin. Greetings, Oasis. So glad you could join us. We love you. We appreciate you as always. If you want to be a blessing out there to Oasis, you know what to do. Go ahead and visit their Facebook page. Visit their website, the links to both of which are in the chat right now, so that you can support them financially. You can support them spiritually through prayer and you can support them in fellowship. They are a part of us. So if you consider yourself a part of the Benevolent Faith Ministries family, you are also part of the Oasis family because they are an extension of us. Thank you, Oasis, as always, for being here. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. We also, of course, want to extend huge hellos and welcomes to all of our sister ministries around the world in Pakistan, in India, in the UK, in Africa. Shout out to everybody out there that supports us that uh, calls themselves a part of the Global Church Body Alliance. It is greatly appreciated. Hey, look, we're all just doing the same work, trying to glorify God and bring a bigger harvest to the kingdom through the work of the Holy Spirit. So we are grateful to be in partnership with you all. That said, you want to help us in that mission, then just hit that invite button. Invite somebody to come out and worship with us this evening. Say, listen, man, it's only an hour service. You get in, you get out, you get on with your life. And if they go over an hour, it's probably because the word was one that the Lord needed to give us. That just took a little bit more time. And of course, if they can't make it on Tuesday, tell them the service replays on Wednesday on this exact same platform, the same link that you use to access what you're watching right now, give it to them so that they can watch it tomorrow at 1 Eastern, noon Central, 10 a.m. Pacific, or, of course, you could always give them the link to our YouTube page, also in the chat right now. They can watch everything we've ever done on that YouTube page. We are so grateful to have so much content on that YouTube page. Y'all know we coming up on like three, four hundred videos on that YouTube page. I mean, we've been doing this since summer of 2020. So, yeah, there's a lot going on on that YouTube page. We appreciate everybody supporting us. And speaking of support... We ask you to, at this time, direct your attention to the screen for this week's announcement. Parents, it's here. A world with amazing adventures and Christian messaging your kids will love. Introducing TruePlay, multiple games in one app. A safe and trusted platform. Go to TruePlayGames.com today to learn more. Don't forget about our summer campaign, our giving campaign that we've entitled Operation Feed the World, where we're raising money not only for food, but for the uh, spreading of the gospel all around the world. So not only does your money go to help buy them food, it goes to create educational centers and plant churches so that people can hear the word of God. People who have never seen a Bible, never seen a television, never seen a cell phone. So therefore, they've never heard about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And so our missionaries out in the field are partners that we're working with in ministry. Shout out to Pastor Shelton Ravi in Andhra Pradesh, Southern India. Shout out to Pastor Roy Hill Rafael in Pakistan. Shout out to Evangelist Nick Brown in the UK. They're all doing this great work to share the gospel with people who never heard it before or who don't have access to it because the country they live in prohibits it. And your money is going to work towards people being educated. You saw the video a couple weeks ago, Pastor Ravi instructing those school children in those tribal villages in India, uh, teaching them how to say Jesus, write Jesus, and learn the alphabet. That's what your money is doing. And we encourage y'all, please continue to give to this campaign, which is gonna be running all summer. Thank you to everybody that has contributed to it so far. Also, don't forget, Download that True Play app so you can get you some money. Get money. If you know of any kids that play video games, then you definitely want to refer them to True Play because they can play some great video games that are not corny and that are fun and engaging. And every time you refer a child or refer their parents and they download the True Play app, you get $25. I know you know 10 people with kids. It's summertime. They're sitting by the pool or they're sitting somewhere with their little devices. Instead of them playing some crazy game that's going to corrupt and warp their mind, have them download them true play games and play some godly Christian-based games that are fun. Think of like Mario Brothers, except it's Christ-based. That's how fun and engaging these games are. And $25 every time you refer somebody. 10 people, that's 250 bucks, man. I know you can use that during these summer months. So... Make sure you go to TruePlayGames.com, become a part of the True Play, True Play affiliate program, and download those apps, not only for yourselves, but for those who have children that you know, so that these kids can start being entertained by better than this worldly nonsense that's currently trying to envelop their minds. Amen? But tonight, my friends, whew, we're talking about a familiar story tonight. And it's taken from the book of Daniel, chapter 3. All of chapter 3. The entire chapter, all 30 verses. And we're going to be examining this text as we speak from the subject, the fire next time. The fire next time. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God in heaven, how gracious you are to allow us to see another day, Father, and just to be awake and alive with your spirit among us, Lord, and to know that your hedge of protection follows us, engulfs us, envelops us, and carries us wherever we go, Father God, so that we can walk boldly. We can walk with confidence in this world. Yes, Lord, we know that the fiery trials and tribulations and troubles of life may try to come up against us, but as long as we are unwavering and steadfast in our faith, in you and in your son, those fires cannot harm us the same way we're going to see tonight. So thank you for giving us a faith that is unshakable and unwavering. May we live up to that mandate and work ourselves out to have that type of faith, Father God, so that you can do what only you can do, Lord. Oh, Lord, who makes all things new, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, you and you alone our rock and redeemer. We just ask for the spirit of the living God to fall fresh and new this day. In Jesus' name, we pray that we heart out there say amen, amen, and amen. The fire next time. And friends, it's story time. Don't you just love a good biblical story? And tonight our story is taken from, like I said, the entire text of the book of Daniel chapter 3. So as I referenced previously, instead of reading the text as we normally do, tonight we're going to summarize this text, and then we're going to examine the implications of this text for our lives afterwards. So let's look into this text. For those that may not be familiar, this is a very famous biblical story. And so by way of review, the setting of our text and what has transpired at this point or up to this point, and the book of Daniel is as follows. Well, the book of Daniel, I should say, came out at a period when Israel was going through some major problems. 
like getting invaded by countries around them, being plundered by those countries and totally devastated by different imperial armies while seeing the best educated Jews carried away into captivity. Imagine somebody comes into your country, comes into your neighborhood, trashes everything, burns down everything, and then takes all the best people away out of the neighborhood. This is what they were going to. Judah had been defeated by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar, who ransacked Jerusalem and ended up taking back the cream of the crop, the most elite and noble Israelites, to serve at his court in Babylon. He took all the smartest people and said, y'all going to come and y'all going to work for me now. And that included Daniel, a prophet, and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay? Now, Daniel and his friends faced the challenge of navigating between the demands that this crazy Babylonian king is putting on them and their own religious principles. He wasn't a follower of the faith, right? So he didn't care about praying and being righteous and all that stuff. He cared about what he cared about. So them working for him, they're running into trouble trying to stick to what they know and believe in while being obedient to this king. So one night, King Nebuchadnezzar has a really disturbing dream, right? It's so bad that he can't even sleep afterwards. We ever had a dream like that? So he calls in his Babylonian magicians and his enchanters, all of his wise people, and he asks them for help. But he refuses to tell them what the dream was actually about. He's basically testing their abilities. He's testing their gangster, if you will. Y'all say y'all can interpret dreams and all that. Well, I'm going to have you all interpret this, but I ain't going to tell you what it was about. Let's see how good y'all really are. Because instead of telling them directly what the dream was about, he informs them that they need to both tell him the dream that he had and interpret it. He says that if they fail to come through doing both of those things, he's going to, quote, tear them limb from limb and, quote, lay their houses in ruins. Basically, he's going to kill them if they don't get it right. However, if somebody can tell him the dream and interpret it properly, then they'll get showered with riches and rewards. Well, none of them are able to do it, so the king orders all of them to be put to death. Meanwhile, Daniel sees all this sudden activity, and he goes and asks the king's head executioner, a guy by the name of Ariok, Ariok, A-R-I-O-C-H, why the king was suddenly you know, going off on everybody out of the blue, including those close to him, his magicians and enchanters. And so Ariok gives him the full 411, filling him in on the situation. So Daniel goes into Nebuchadnezzar and asks for a little time to discover the dream and relay the interpretation, the interpretation of the dream. And the king agrees to this. So then Daniel goes to his boy, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he says, look, y'all need to pray to God because I need God's intervention to help me interpret this dream. And they do, and the prayers are effective. So during the night, Daniel has a vision that reveals the dream to him and its interpretation. Because remember, Nebuchadnezzar didn't tell anybody what the dream was about. So you had to guess what the dream was about and then interpret it. And God gives this to Daniel. So next day, Daniel's brought in before the king and he interprets the dream. And he says that the king saw a giant, frightening statue of a human being, one with a head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, a stomach and thighs of bronze, lower legs made of iron, and feet made of mixed iron and clay. Suddenly, Daniel said, he sees a stone. One that's not made by human hands. And the stone hits the statue on its weak part, the clay part, the iron, the clay and iron feet part. And the statue collapses into pieces and gets blown away by the wind. But the stone turns into a giant mountain that covers the entire earth. So the, the king is like, yo, that was the dream. You're amazing. Now tell me what it means. So then Daniel interprets the dream as follows. He tells King Nebuchadnezzar that the king is the head, the gold, and the silver part of the statue is an inferior kingdom that will replace him. 
And the bronze part is a third kingdom that will, quote, rule over the whole earth. And the iron kingdom will be one that, quote, crushes and smashes everything. The kingdom will get divided, symbolized by the clay and the iron feet. It will be partly strong and partly fragile. And the stone that's thrown at the statue symbolizes the kingdom of God which will utterly annihilate all of these kingdoms and permanently replace them standing for all time. And that's the dream's interpretation. So of course, Nebuchadnezzar's like, bravo, very impressive. And so he bows down and worships Daniel and praises Daniel's God, saying that Daniel's God is clearly, quote, the God of gods for allowing Daniel to solve the king's puzzling dream. So then he gives Daniel this huge promotion, right? He makes him the ruler of the province of Babylonia. That's like the equivalent of being the mayor. And he makes him the head of all the wise men, who, by the way, should be thanking their lucky stars for Daniel, because since he interpreted the dream and um, said what the dream was, now they're not going to be put to death anymore, okay? So, of course, Daniel, being who he is and always looking out for his boys, he gets Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cushy positions alongside him, helping to oversee the everyday business of Babylon. And you would think that'd be the happy ending to the story, but it's just getting started. So now, likely based on this disturbing vision or dream that he just interpreted had, or had interpreted, Nebuchadnezzar builds a giant golden statue and sets it up on a plain near Babylon on this, you know, this terrain of land, sets it up out in the desert. He then gathers all of the officials together and the VIPs from throughout the Babylonian Empire and its different nations and languages, everybody that they conquered, everybody up under his jurisdiction and his purview. He gathers them all together and he invites them to come to the statue's dedication ceremony. So when everybody's assembled, they ordered to bow down and worship the golden statue when the music strikes up, or else they're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace as a punishment for not listening to the king and bowing down when he told them to. And so everybody bows down and does what they're told. Well, almost everybody. Some Babylonians who are paying, first of all, here, think about this. Some Babylonians see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not bowing down, and then they go and tell them. Now, how did they not see them bowing down unless they were being nosy and going like this and looking around themselves? So they, were, they weren't being obedient either, but they were so eager to get in the king's good graces and to tell on somebody that they go tell on these three Hebrew boys, they didn't bow down. They don't want to listen to you, king. And it always the butt kissers that always ended up causing the most trouble. So, Nebuchadnezzar flips out, which is, you know, what he does mainly, and he orders that Jewish trio, those three boys, to be brought to him. And he's like, so uh, what's going on? Is it true? You guys really don't want to bow down? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego immediately admit, not only that we're not going to worship this statue, but our God is powerful enough to save us from the fiery furnace if you're going to throw us in there as a result of us not bowing down. And we bet we survived that and prove how powerful our God really is. So, of course, you know Nebuchadnezzar ain't having that. Oh, y'all going to talk back and then say you're going to do whatever you want and you're going to survive <laughs> as a result? So basically you're saying oh, we ain't going to do it and you're going to take it and like it. <laughs> That's not something you tell a king. So instead, he arranges for them to get tossed into the furnace, just like he promised, and he orders the furnace to be turned up seven times hotter than its normal temperature. Oh, y'all want to act like y'all ain't going to do what I say, huh? Not only am I going to throw y'all in here, we're going to turn up the heat on you fools, right? So Nebuchadnezzar's henchmen prepare to toss these fully clothed three Hebrew boys into the furnace, but instead... His henchmen get burned to death in the process of trying to toss the trio into the furnace. And so the trio do get tossed into the furnace eventually, even though the henchmen die. And Nebuchadnezzar's looking 
to see. And he's like, yo, how come they're not burning? Furthermore, how come I see another person in there? Yo, didn't we throw three of them in there? He's like, yeah, we did. Then why do I see four men standing in the furnace? And that fourth person looks like a son of the gods. And he's moving about in there with the other three. So now he's like, whoa, this is crazy. And he's kind of impressed. So he calls Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fire. And they come out completely unscathed. No burns, clothes ain't burned, none of that. And all the king's officials, officials are, of course, surprised by this. And those three boys are praising God the whole time. They went in praising them. They were in there praising them in the fire. And they come out of the fire praising him. And Nebuchadnezzar's like, hmm, y'all faith is really, really something. So that's the entire text of Daniel chapter three. Because after that, you know, he makes these proclamations and all that good stuff. But in the context of being believers and walking in the faith as these men did in tonight's story, is some key significance contained within this story for us. Because this happened thousands upon thousands of years ago. But it has some implications for us today. Things that we should keep in mind today as, as followers of Christ. And in a time of extreme tribulation and trouble, these three Hebrew boys looked to God and glorified him despite their circumstances. Y'all know what I'm going to say. They used their faith eyes and not their faces eyes when they were staring down trouble and staring down the issues that they were about to be in. Saints of God, we all have to face our fiery furnaces in this life at one point or another. We all are going to go through fiery trials. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe you've got something plaguing you health-wise right now that you're not sure you're going to make it out of. And you just need to lean on the everlasting arm of the Lord to get you through it. Maybe it's some financial issues that you're going through right now. You don't know how you're going to make it from day to day. And you just really need the Lord's intervention in your finances. Maybe it's a family issue you're going through. you just continuously praying for your child, that wayward child, that wayward sister or brother, that mother or father who's having health issues that you got to take care of them. And you don't know how you're going to do that and continue working full time. You just don't have the money or the resources to do any of it. We're all going to go through fiery trials of some kind in our lives. The question, though, is how much will you trust God in your fiery furnace experience? And so that's where we get our big idea tonight, my friends. If you don't get nothing else from tonight's message, please get this message, which is this, or this idea, I should say, which is this. We must glorify the Lord even in our fires, that is, even in our trials and tribulations. We must glorify the Lord even in our fires. That means no matter how bad life gets, how troubling things may become, we still need to glorify God through those circumstances because that's how we're going to get through them. And that's how you tap into that supernatural power of God. Listen, the reality is that most of us will likely never have to face the ordeal of entering a literal fiery furnace like these three guys did. However, it is still true that if we're determined to be faithful to the Lord, then we should be ready to suffer for our faith, y'all. Because if Christ suffered, then why wouldn't we suffer also, right? Are we somehow above suffering when he wasn't? Of course not. Like, do we think we're somehow better than him? That he had to go through all that, but we won't, and we call ourselves his followers? That doesn't make sense. Notice how the apostle Peter puts this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. 
but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And see y'all, this is where people get Christianity or being a believer completely twisted. Somehow they get this unfounded idea that once you begin following Christ, suddenly your life is going to be perfect and you no longer have to worry about all the problems of life that you had before you got saved. But nothing can be further from the truth. There is no immunity from trials and troubles simply because we belong to the Lord now. Just because we follow Christ and pledge to live differently does not mean that we're not still going to go through it because we are. He went through it. Why wouldn't we? In fact, the Bible is clear that we should expect testing as part of our heritage in Christ. Look at John chapter 16, verse 33. Gospel of John 16, verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus is like, you're going to go through stuff. Just don't worry about it because I've already conquered death and there's nothing worse than death. After death, that's it. So if I can conquer that, I can pretty much deal with whatever issue is that you're going through. Just trust me in it and trust it over to my care. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29 puts it this way. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. If you think that following Christ means, oh, all of a sudden I'm immune and I have immunity from anything that could bother me or any trials I could go through, you are fooling yourself. In fact, you are opening yourself up to the idea I should say, when you follow Christ, you're opening yourself up to the concept that, yes, you're going to suffer in some way, shape, or form. So you need to get ready for it. And you know what? Speaking of getting Christianity twisted, here's another lesson to be found in this text. If we make a close enough examination of the behaviors and the attitudes that we initially see from King Nebuchadnezzar. Y'all like, wait a minute, what you mean, Rev? Well, take note of how when Daniel interpreted the dream, he bowed down and worshiped Daniel's God like your God is clearly the God of all gods, right? Remember when he said that? But then he went right back into engaging in self-serving activity by building the statue and inviting people to the unveiling ceremony immediately afterwards. It's like, why are you talking out the side of your neck? You claim that my God is the true God and you're impressed by it. But you ain't listen to nothing that he said. In the dream, he said that you was going to get yours. Instead, you build a statue anyway. It's almost like you wanted it to happen. So either A, he truly did not understand the dream's interpretation. Otherwise, he would have immediately gotten some act right. Or B, he was basically mocking the same God he had just praised, which seems more likely based on what happened afterwards. Either way, the lessons for us are clear. Number one, when God shows you something, don't ignore it. That was Nebuchadnezzar's problem. Clearly, he didn't listen to what God was telling him through Daniel. Friends, God is a gentleman. He'll allow you to do your own thing separate from his will. But please believe that he will hold you accountable for not doing his will ultimately. There will always be consequences for trying to do it your own way. Proverbs chapter 1, 24 to 33 puts it this way. Because I have called and you refuse to listen, I have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all of my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. God is like, you didn't want to listen to me when I tried to warn you behind before. You mocked me and waved me off and poo-pooed me. Now that bad stuff's happening, you want to, oh God, 
I ain't got time for you now. Now remember, this is the God of the Old Testament. We have a God in Christ Jesus who still hears our prayers as long as we repent and turn to him. So if you've been mocking God to this point in your life and God's been clearly talking to you and you've been trying to ignore him, it's not too late. Otherwise, this will be your fate. You might want to start listening to God. So that's the first thing. When God shows you something, don't ignore it. When, if you don't listen to God, expect it to go very badly for you. That's the first thing. Secondly, God is not to be mocked ever. Don't mock God. Don't play with God like that. Scripture is very clear in this regard. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. God's like, don't play with me. You want to keep being trifling and whatnot? Okay, you're going to get what's coming to you. But if you listen and obey what the Spirit is telling you, what my son has already told you to do, then you will have eternal life and you'll come be in heaven with me. Don't play with me. Remember when your parents used to be like, boy, don't test me. Girl, don't test me. That's God. That's our eternal parent saying that. Don't play with me. And I advise you very strongly, don't play with God. Because a lot of people have and they're... <laughs> burning in hell right now, talking about what's that smell, right? And it's them barbecuing. Ain't that what Nebuchadnezzar eventually found out? The Bible says that he ultimately went crazy and was forced to wander in the wilderness with the beasts for seven years before he finally re uh, repented and proclaimed the sovereignty of God. He definitely reaped what he sold for trying to mock God. Because God ain't the one you want to play with, y'all. So our scene is set here, right? This vivid and dramatic record of God showing up and showing out on behalf of these men and rewarding their faith despite the circumstances and the temptations that they faced. And saints of God, every day in some way, we're all tempted to deny the Lord whom we love just as these three men were tempted. Every day we face fiery trials that can threaten our very lives in the same way that it did for these three men. So let's next examine this story with the goal of determining the lessons that we can glean from their actions for our own lives. And the first point of reference that we want to give consideration to from this text relates to the challenge that they faced. The challenge that they faced, I'm right out of the text, verses 1 to 7. Verses 1 to 7 talks in great detail about how Nebuchadnezzar set up the golden statue out on the plains. And it was this huge monument, right? 90 feet high, 9 feet wide. It was probably a, the replica of the statue he saw in his dream, which is, again, you would think, since Daniel gave the interpretation, he would have stayed far away from that. Nope. Went out and built one right up. And think about it. 90 feet is like the total distance around a regulation baseball diamond. Okay. Or put it this way, Shaquille O'Neal, seven foot one or seven two or something like that. Imagine 13 or 12 and a half Shaquille O'Neal's stacked on top of each other. That's how tall this statue would have been. It was huge. And everybody was commanded to be present at the dedication of the statue. And of course, that terrible penalty would be imposed if you didn't bow down to worship it when the music started. And everybody did that except for the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were determined to be faithful to God at all costs. We're not bowing down to your statue. We only bow down to our God, and that's that. And so that begs the question, my friends. When it comes to the challenges which we all face, how do we react in situations where our faith in God should be unwavering and unquestioned? Because it is so easy to just go along with the crowd, ain't it? It's easy for people to try to keep up with the Joneses because they don't want to be left out or made to look like the outcast or the weird person for not doing what everybody else is doing. And instead to go along with the herd mentality, do what everybody else is doing, and to go along with the ways and the thinking of the rest of the world and therefore to fail 
the Lord by doing so? That's not what these men did. They were victorious in the hour of their supreme testing. So how did they do it? Well, that brings us to our second point of reference from this text, and that's the compromise that they refused. The compromise they refused. They faced this challenge, and instead of giving in to what everybody else did, they refused to compromise. Verses 8 through, eight, uh, 8 through 18 tells us that, that the haters reported them to the king. And he invited them up and was like, explain yourselves. And they explained themselves and he didn't like it and threw them in the fiery furnace. And here was the temptation for them to compromise. Think about it. Essentially, the king is like, look, just do this one thing, right? Do it in order to please me. I mean, what harm can it really do for you to bow down and worship me in this moment? You really think your God's going to get that mad? Come on, just go on and worship me, right? Instead, these men steadfastly refused to get themselves out of this situation at the expense of their conscience. And they failed to do it to bring dishonor upon the name of the Lord in the process. They wasn't trying to do any of that. So they defied the king instead. They were like, no, nah, we ain't doing all that, man. We will not compromise our faith in the Lord no matter what you do. Friends, as believers walking in faith every day, we need to take our cues from the faith demonstrated by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in these verses. We need to remain loyal enough to the Lord that we stand out with the minority, not with the majority. In other words, every day we need to demonstrate our willingness to stand by our principles and our beliefs even when nobody else will. And even when we might face extreme persecution for doing so. That's something that Pastor Ravi and Pastor Raheel are doing right now every day. They get persecuted in their country for preaching the gospel. That don't stop them. The threat of being arrested, maybe even killed, that doesn't stop them. Their faith in God is what compels them to do that. How faithful are you to the things of God? Is your faith level up there? Understand this. This is not something that is unique only to God's people, okay? And we see it all through the text of the Bible. Moses was forced with this temptation and he resisted it. Hebrews 11, verses 24 to 27 puts it this way. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses didn't waver in his faith, despite what he was looking at, despite the dangers. Same thing with Jesus. Jesus was also tempted with temptation, and he resisted it. You see that in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, where Jesus endured 40 days and nights of fasting in the wilderness, of which, and at which time, I should say, he gets tempted by Satan, who offers Jesus bread and power and tries to get him to test the power of God. But Jesus basically tells him that no means no and continuously hits him with scripture. Every time the devil tried to tempt Jesus with something, Jesus came back with scripture. Let that be a lesson. When you get tempted in this life or when the fiery trials come up against you, just go to the word of God and speak the word into that situation the same way Jesus did. That's how you tap into the power of God in your situation. The Apostle Stephen, he's another one. He's another biblical personage who faced temptation. Here he is standing before the Jewish council because some haters had lied on him and said that he had blasphemed on the name of God. So he gets called before the Jewish council. They're like, explain yourself. And instead of being like, I didn't do that. I don't know what they're talking about. He instead says, you know what? Now that I'm here, let me go in and tell y'all about yourselves and how trifling y'all are for killing Christ, who was the son of God, right? And you know they wasn't having that. And as a result, he was stoned to death. You can read about that in Acts chapter 7. In each of these instances, we see a steadfast refusal to compromise faith in the Lord in the heat of the moment when things really got thick. So again, 
Are we willing to do that? Be real with yourself now. Is your faith strong enough to show the same level of courage that these three men did? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that Moses did, that Jesus did, that Stephen did. When the heat is on, when it's the heat of heat, in the heat of heat, the heat is so hot. Are we going to be like them and get our Patty Austin on when it really gets thick? You understand what I'm saying? Because a lot of people don't do that. They don't have that courage in the moment and they shirk from it. Well, part of the courage that these three men had came in the moment relates to our third point of reference, which is the confidence that they possessed. The confidence that they possessed, and I'm right out of the text, verses 19 to 23. In spite of this really dreadful alternative that's facing them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego steadfastly refused to worship the golden image because their whole trust was in God, not in what their circumstances looked like. That's what a lot of people do. They see with their faces eyes and they see the circumstances and so they give in to the circumstances. No, see with your faith eyes like they do and look past the circumstances to a God who is actually in control of your circumstances and is the only one that can change your circumstances just like that. That's what they did. In fact, the king told his people again, turn that furnace up seven times hotter because these cats think I'm playing and it didn't even matter to them. And that's a lesson for us. He was trying to scare them by turning the heat up. When the heat gets hotter, y'all, don't melt. Just endure the same way that they did. So when the king's goons try to throw them in the fire, instead, they the ones that got burnt up. My mans and them, they walked straight out the fire like it wasn't nothing. Notice the significance of the level of confidence that they had. Namely, that they had, remember we said the confidence they possessed. It's coming out in verses 19 to 23. Here's the first thing they had confidence in. That was the power of God. It's from their own words. The text says, quote, the God we serve is able. In other words, they were fully confident that their God was stronger and more mighty than anybody in the Babylonia, than any army, than any king, than anybody anywhere. They was like, yeah, the God we serve is able. That's our confidence in him. We ain't worried about you. Friends, we need to have that same confidence in the fires that we face. The Bible is clear that, first of all, nothing is too hard for God. Genesis chapter 18, verse 14 puts it this way. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. He was like, ain't nothing too hard for me, Abraham. I don't care how old y'all are. I can make her have a son because I'm God. I can do anything. Nothing's too hard for God, and all things are possible to him. Matthew 19, 26. But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Because only God can make three men walk out of a furnace and their clothes not even be burned or smell like smoke. Only God can do that, right? But then notice what they said next in the text, which is the epitome of exemplifying confidence and the second example of this confidence. Remember, we're talking about the confidence that they, uh, they demonstrated, uh, the confidence that they possessed. And that's the purpose of God. Look at what they said. They said, "We, the God we serve is able. And then they said, but even if he does not, oh, I love that so much. That is an unwavering confidence in God. We know our God's going to save us from this fire. But even if he don't, that's not going to shake our confidence. We still going to believe in him as we're burning up to death. Because then we know we're going to be with him. That's the type of confidence that we should have. They were like, God will deliver us. We believe that. But even if he doesn't deliver us, his will and, and, and that we die, that must have been his will, and his will is best for us anyway. So it was just better for us to be dead. That's how we look at it. Whew. If we can only live our lives like that, y'all, to understand that when we go through these fiery trials, yes, we believe God will protect us and get us through it. But even if he doesn't, we still going to be all right anyway. That is true faith. True faith means being ready to trust God to fulfill his purpose 
whatever that purpose may be. Because you may not agree with the purpose. But whatever that purpose may be, you cool with it. That's true faith. It's a faith that says like Job said in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. It's the type of faith that Paul talked about in Romans chapter 14, verse 8, when he said, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Paul's like, it don't matter if I live or die. I'm going to glorify God and worship God regardless. If I'm facing death, I ain't going to suddenly switch up and denounce the Lord so that I can live. No, I'm going to stay dedicated to him no matter what. Can you honestly say that about your life? When people come around you and they start talking about, oh, you Christians, this, that, and the third, do you clam up and not defend your faith the way you're supposed to? I'm just saying, y'all, finally, and I'm done. Our fourth point of reference relates to the companionship that they enjoyed. The companionship that they enjoyed. You know, we always like to end on a high note. And this is verses 24 to 27. These verses tell us that they were not alone in the fire. The Lord was there with them, just as he always is with his people when they suffer in his name. The presence of the Lord with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire was the guarantee of their protection, meaning that even a raging fire turned up seven times hotter couldn't touch them, couldn't touch them. No, 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 no. They was getting a hammer on because it was God's will that the fire not harm them. God's companionship is true and tested, y'all. And the Bible is clear in supporting this idea that God never calls us to enter our furnace experiences alone. God will never let you go through that fiery trial alone as long as you belong to him. And you're obedient to him. Look at Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What's my point? My point is that God is always with us. And he blesses us in our fiery furnace experiences in a way we could never be blessed had we not experienced those fires. Look at how 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 puts it. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, that's the fire, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ Jesus. You know what that's saying? You got to go through some stuff so that once you get through it, you can glorify God and be a testimony to other people about the power of Christ in your life and therefore the power he can have in their life. That's what that's saying, because God will not leave you nor forsake you. Didn't he already promise that a long time ago? We need to hold God to his promises. But of course, again, those promises are not applicable. If you off being trifling, doing whatever you want to do, you got to be righteous. You got to be obedient. But if you are, please believe these promises apply to you. Don't miss what 1 Peter 1, 7 is saying. One main reason why the Lord allows us to be tested is that by our quiet confidence in him in the hour of trial and testing and by the manifestation of his power and glory, others may be blessed as well. And that's how the kingdom gets extended, y'all. That's your part in the kingdom. Testify about the goodness of God even when things are bad so that when people who are living in a world where things are always bad, can see that, well, dang, things are bad for you, but you're still glorifying God and you still have joy. How can I get me some of that? 
What must I do to be saved? That's what we want to hear, right? Because ultimately, all of us want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the surefire way to be on your way towards hearing that. So as we close this evening, y'all, understand that much like those three Hebrew boys in this story, God stays with us through our trials and tribulations and provides us with his divine protection as he does so. Psalm 66, verses 12, uh, 10 to 12 puts it like this. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let man ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You sent me through all of that and I struggled and I cried and I trembled in fear on certain days, but I'm on the other side now glorifying you, God, Father, because you brought me through that and now I have a testimony for everybody else that's getting ready to go through it or who is going through it now. Thank you, Lord God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Friends, despite being faced with the enemy's fiery trials in this life, our faith in God will prevail. What our circumstances look like should not dictate how we react in faith to God. Remember, use your faith eyes, not your face's eyes. God seeks our faithfulness in him when the circumstances look their worst. That's using your faith eyes. So knowing all that and taking into account how things turned out for the three Hebrew boys in this story. By the way, at the end, they were Daniel was appointed to even a higher position and so were they over all the land. And they all prospered coming out of that fiery trial. Knowing all this was based on their unwavering faith in God despite their circumstances. Ask yourself, how are you going to react to the fire next time? Amen. But listen, You'll never experience God's protections in the fiery trials of your life if you don't first have access to God through the only way to get access to him. And that's through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to gain access to God's divine protection? You've got to go through the source which is Jesus Christ and having faith in him. Here's your chance to do that. Is there one? Won't you come forward today? Prayerfully, you've heard this story and you're like, man, I can relate. I'm going through so many fiery trials right now that I'm just burning up from all angles. But as you see, they were thrown in a real literal furnace and did not burn because of their unwavering faith. You need to have that same unwavering faith in your trials. But if you don't know Jesus, you'll never have that faith. Here's your chance. Is there one? Won't you come today? The time for waiting is over. The time to repent is now, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Won't you come? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We always applaud at this time for no other reason that we know the seed has been planted. We pray it's been planted deep in some good soil, that your heart was ready to receive this message and that it wasn't rocky and that the birds are gonna come and pick the seeds away because it wasn't able to germinate and take root in the soil of your heart. You gotta let it take root. That's the only way you're gonna enjoy the provisions of God's word and the protection, the divine protection from God's spirit. That's how you get through this crazy world that we got going on out here. That's how you deal with the troubles in your life. That is how you address the fire next time. Amen.